In this video, I'll talk about special considerations for texturing procedural and infinite 3D terrain with physically based materials. This includes triplanar sampling because of no UVs, albedo mapping, creating tangents for bump or normal mapping, metallic mapping, softness mapping, and occlusion mapping, blending between different textures and the same material, single material with multiple textures and procedural blending, issues with the uh, parallax effect when using triplanar sampling, floating point errors, and changing far and near planes to accommodate for them. UVs describe how a texture should be mapped onto a 3D model. Usually UVs are set manually by unwrapping and transferring the UV positions of each vertex in a 3D modeling software like Blender. Since this terrain is procedural and infinite, it's not possible to manually set the UV position of each vertex. Instead, we use a technique called triplanar sampling. In triplanar sampling, we first sample the texture as if it was a flat plane for each of the x, y, and z directions. Then we blend between the results using the normal of the vertex. Using triplanar sampling, we can properly map the textures that we want onto our train mesh. In a physically based material, we use different textures to give the mesh more detail. This includes the albedo mapping, normal or bump mapping, metallic mapping, softness mapping, and occlusion mapping. The albedo map is the color values of a surface without any directional lights on it. This is what the train would look like without any maps on it. This is without albedo, normal, or any of the other maps. It only has the color black on it. The lighting is still working. That's why some parts are shaded and some parts are not. It looks pretty cool, but uh, now we're gonna put back the albedo on the train. This is what the train looks like with only the albedo map on. It's much more colorful than before, but it still feels like it's lacking something. The next map we're going to apply is the normal or bump map. These kinds of maps are usually used to increase the detail level of the mesh using fake lighting bumps and dents. As you can see on this image, the two cubes are the same mesh, but the mesh on the right looks like it has a lot more detail because of the normal map. I had a problem with Unity's rendering pipeline for a procedural mesh. Whenever I set the normal map, the whole train would be just black, no lighting or anything like before. Eventually I figured out that the problem was that I didn't have tangents. Tangents are related to UVs in that they're manually created and applied. Since this was not possible, I created fake tangents by using the perpendicular vector to the normal. This is what the train looks like with normal maps on. As you can see, there are some smaller shadows that increase the detail of the train. Overall, it's starting to look pretty realistic, but in a physically based system, there's still some more maps that we can add. The remaining maps are the metallic map, the smoothness map, and the occlusion map. As the name suggests, a metallic map describes which part of the model are metallic, reflective, or and which parts are not. Higher values, wider pixels are more metallic, as you can see on this image. Similarly, a smoothness map, almost also known as the microsurface detail, is used in lighting calculations where the microsurface detail can be seen by the amount of light that is diffused as it bounces off the object. A perfectly smooth surface reflects like a mirror. 
Finally, the occlusion map dictates how much indirect lighting a certain part of the mesh should receive. This is what the train looks like with all the maps on. Albedo, normal, metallic, smoothness, and occlusion. With all those maps, the physically based material is complete and the train looks somewhat realistic. There's also another map called the parallax map that displaces pixels to create the illusion of death as the viewer's eyes move across the scene. Applying the parallax map with triplanar was quite expensive in terms of performance and the results were not great, so I ditched them. Procedural Blending The best way to smoothly transition between the green grass and the grey rocks is to have both of the sets of maps in one material and then in that material we interpolate between the two different maps using a value like the normal. The value used to interpolate can be something else like the height in case of uh, transitioning between the normal terrain and snow. Another benefit of having them all in the same material is that it's less draw calls. On the other side, if you have too many textures in the same material, you can run into performance problems. This is why the sand is in a different material. That however means that there's no smooth transitioning between the sand and the rest of the terrain. Floating point errors. Since this is an infinite and procedurally generated terrain, we can go very far and still have the terrain be there. This however introduces another problem. As the coordinates get very big, floating point numbers used to represent them can start having precision issues. This is the case for rendering and for shadows. That's why as we get very far, you start seeing the terrain flicker. The permanent solution for this is to use a floating origin. This means that as the player moves very far, you relocate the terrain player and everything else back to the origin. However, I found a simpler and temporary solution, which was to change the near and far planes of the rendering camera. This didn't have a big effect on the rendering distance of the chunks as that was already limited by the performance. But yeah, that's it for this video. Next up I'm working on procedural placement of trees and train features. If you want to see more frequent updates, follow me on Twitter. If you don't want to miss the next video, subscribe. See ya.